Last time we talked about uh, frequency analysis and we showed how we can break any monoalphabetic substitution cipher. Actually, frequency analysis can be used for uh, ciphers that replace more than one letter. Too. So actually, uh, you have to increase the uh, numbers, uh, sorry, uh, the number of letters to replace to provide a secure crypto system. Actually, this idea would lead to block ciphers at the end. So now I want to talk about some real world examples to emphasize the uh, importance of cryptanalysis. Because uh, uh, it changed history a lot, actually. So I would like to give some uh, historical examples. And uh, let's start with the, an example from World War I. It is, uh, this Zimmerman telegram is very famous. So let me summarize what it was. It was a diplomatic proposal. Uh, uh, so a diplomatic proposal sent in 1917 from the German Empire offering a military alliance with Mexico in case US enters the First World War. So it was dispatched by the Foreign Secretary Arthur Zimmerman. So this is why it is known as the Zimmerman Telegram. And it was coded with diplomatic cipher uh, 13,040. Uh, it was a direct telegraph transmission, sorry, direct te telegraph transmission was not possible because the British had cut the German international cables at the outbreak of war. However, the USA allowed limited use of its diplomatic cables for Germany to communicate with its ambassador in Washington. The message was delivered to the US embassy in Berlin and then transmitted by diplomatic cable to Copenhagen and then to London for over transmission over transatlantic cable to Washington. The Germans assumed that the US cable was secure and used it extensively. So actually this is the telegram they sent. So British who are listening to this communication captured these numbers. So in a code-based encryption, all of these numbers, actually there is a book where each uh, word is replaced by a, this kind of a number. So you have to look at that book and uh, you have to replace these words from that book to obtain the message. So British had captured the documents about diplomatic cipher 13,040 in Mesopotamia. So they actually know which code word it matched with which word. The disclosure would expose room 40's breaking of German codes and also that Britain was eavesdropping on the US cable. So they have to stay silent. As a cover story, the British could publicly claim that their agents had stolen the telegram deciphered text in Mexico. Privately, the British needed to give the Americans the this cipher so that the US government could independently verify the authenticity of the message with their own commercial telegraphic records. However, the Americans agreed to back the official cover story. So revelation, so with this revelation, uh, uh, this outraged American public opinion, because at the beginning of the war, uh, American citizens didn't want to have part in the war because they thought that this wasn't their war. But with this uh, telegram deciphered and made public in the newspapers, this caused an outrage in American public opinion and helped generate support for United States declaration of war on Germany in April, 1917. So a portion of the telegram as decrypted by British Naval Intelligence codebreakers is as follows. As you can see, here are the codes and uh, these are the words in the codebook. Uh, these are German words like this means and and so on. As you can see in the plain text, they had to write the state Arizona, but in the code book, they don't have the uh, number for such a word because you cannot uh, create a code word for every word because there will be some words that you will be missing and Arizona is an example. So they have to use these four codes for A, R, I, Z and so on to, in order to write the word Arizona. So this is how code based uh, actual encryption works. So once you decipher the whole message, uh, this is the decrypted version of it. So it says it's actually it says that. Um, so let me read it from here. In the event of this succeeding, we uh, okay. Let me start from the beginning. We intend to begin on the first of February on risk submarine warfare. We shall endeavor, in spite of this, to keep the United States of America neutral. In the event of this not succeeding, 
we make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Make more together, make peace together, generous financial support, and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. So uh, they said that the South America would be Mexico's if they uh, joined the war uh, with them. So this is why uh, American public opinion changed, and this is why actually United States joined the war in April 1917. Without the uh, description of this telegram, uh, the fate of war will, might be different. So after the first world war, now we have some technological advancements and cipher machines uh, start to replace pen and paper methods. So a famous example is Enigma because most probably you have seen in a, a lot of movies. So an Enigma machine is an electromechanical rotor cipher machine. It was used in 20th century military and commercial sectors like banking. So since we always see it in movies, people think that this machine is uh, developed by Germans just to uh, communicate in the war. But just before the Second World War, actually you could buy such a uh, machine, most probably for the case of cases like banking and so on. But when the war outbreaks, so they use these machines in military too. It generates a polyalphabetic substitution cipher, so it's like uh, more than one letter is replaced, substituted by this cipher. And cryptanalysis of Enigma by British mathematicians and cryptologists at the Bleshley Park, with the initial help of Polish cryptologists, changed the course of Second World War because a lot of people actually survive just by a few mathematicians uh, living in a mansion to. Uh, break some of the cipher text. So initially they had the help of Polish cryptologists because um, they have to, since they knew German, uh, they have to understand the encoding here. So this is one of the things that we are going to talk later. In order for people or devices to communicate, uh, they first have to agree on the uh, language they are using. So it will be the encoding in the modern world where we will be talking about ASCII tables and so on. So we always assume that communicating parties know which uh, language they are using. So here is a picture from actually Wikipedia, the famous one. This an Enigma machine is something like this. You have the rotors here. So actually positions of the rotors are your secret key. Depending on those positions, when you press a, a letter here, uh, as a cipher text, it produces something else and the position of the rotors maybe changes. So uh, communicating parties should have the same position so that they can uh, encrypt and decrypt their messages. So here is a picture I took from Bleshley Park. Uh, this is a, a advanced version of those uh, cipher machines. And this is actually one of the latest. So let me read the caption for you. This is called SG-41. The SG-41 was the last cipher machine developed by Germany during World War II. The SG-41 operates on a pinwheel and not a rotor basis and was intended to replace the Enigma. This cipher machine was introduced in 1944 and defeated the code breakers at Bleshley Park. Approximately 500 machines were uh, produced and fewer than 10 are known to survive. So this was one of the uh, latest uh, cipher machines developed by Germany and um, it, people couldn't able to uh, break this device. So if the uh, war continues longer, uh, British would be unable to decipher most of the messages they were, uh, cipher text they were capturing from Germany. So let's look at the cryptanalysis of Enigma and see how uh, some impossible events actually help you to decipher a message. So Enigma had a, a weakness. A letter is never encrypted to itself. So this is actually probably put in the system as a good measure, as a precaution, because maybe if when you are unlucky, for instance, when you write a word like five letters or something, and if you are unlucky, all of the letters you press will be mapped to themselves. And that letter, uh, when you somebody captures the ciphertext, they will be able to see some words that can be, that is the same as the plain text. So they might understand a few things about the plain text. 
So in order to prevent it, they put a countermeasure saying that a letter is never encrypted to itself. But uh, British uh, use this impossibility event to break the cipher. So we mentioned that statistics is important in uh, cryptanalysis. In the frequency analysis, we use the uh, highly probable events, which are the frequency of letters. In this case, we are using an event that has probability zero, which is actually impossible. So what they did was as follows. They listened to the, actually the watchtowers at the end of the, most of the time to the closest uh, places they can get. So by listening to radio communication, they capture ciphertext like this. And they say that since at that time there is nothing going on, they say that maybe this watchtower sending messages like there is nothing to report. But in a very special way, because in German, this is keine besondere Ereignisse. When it's translated, means nothing to report, but uh, maybe it's something that you rarely use in uh, daily language. Like in Turkish, we say that Asayishberkemak, but you never use it in daily life. So they say that probably they're sending this message during their ciphertext. So let's write the ciphertext here and put these words below it and see if there are some matching letters. So here, as you can see, they match. So they say that, okay, then they cannot be sending this message starting from this position because this is impossible. So they shift this plain text one position uh, right and so on and see if uh, there are cases where no matches occur. So in this case, this does not match with this one. So they say that maybe here they send this message. So Let's take the Enigma machine and modify the rotor so that this uh, cipher text is mapped to Kaina Besondra and Eregnese. So once you do it, you continue deciphering the rest of the cipher text and see if it matches something meaningful in German. So if it does, then this means that you break the system. So this is how they actually uh, captured a lot of plain text from uh, the cipher text that were encrypted by Enigma. So Germans constantly modified their machines during the war and their latest cipher machines eluded alive cryptologists. As I showed you a picture of SG-41, which wasn't, uh, which British were not able to cryptanalyze. So uh, the technological advancements, uh, the uh, when they were breaking the system, they had to try make a lot of trials. So doing this by hand was not that easy. So for this reason, actually, they invented the first programmable electronic digital computer in 1943. This is called as Colossus computer. It was developed by British codebreakers at Bletchley Park. And Bletchley Park is just somewhere in the middle of Oxford and Cambridge. This was actually designed by them to cryptonize Lorentz cipher. And Alan Turing's use of probability in cryptanalysis contributed to its design. So it optically reads a paper tape and then applies programmable logical functions to the bits of the key and ciphertext characters, counting how often the function returns false. So it is like a, a CPU and reads the data from this a paper tape and performs operations. It was destroyed by British after the Second World War because this was a huge technological advancement and they feared that if uh, other countries captured this uh, technology, they may move, maybe move forward than them. So they destroyed the machine and actually, uh, and they actually people at Bletchley Park ask how we destroy it. And as far as I know, the prime minister said that no piece should be bigger than my fist. So this is why they destroyed it. But the good thing is that it was reconstructed in 2007 and it is available in Bletchley Park in a museum. I actually uploaded a video of this reconstructed version to YouTube and you can see how this machine works. Actually, it's a huge machine, bigger than most of the rooms uh, in a building. So in the museum, you can see some uh, machine fragments. These were the parts of the, some of the machines. And here's some of the parts from the Colossus uh, computer. Uh, only few known original Colossus fragments survive as it was written here. So, if this pandemic uh, hopefully ends someday, I hope that uh, you can visit this museum uh, and see these parts by yourself.